You live? All okay. right. Hi. Hello, everybody. I'm Kenneth Hardcastle. I'm Anna Karras. And this is the Collier County Public Library Virtual Book Club. Yay. Welcome. Uh, this month, we are discussing uh, The Plague of Doves by Louise Erdrich. So The Plague of Doves starts with the unsolved murder of a farm family in Pluto, North Dakota in 1911, and follows the entwined lives of past and future generations of the white people and Native Americans living in and around the town and the nearby reservation. There are four narrators throughout the course of the book, more if you count the stories told to the narrators. Uh, we get secondhand stories about the fates of several generations of the Peace family, uh, loosely representing the fate of many Native Americans living in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, it's described as a novel, but I wonder if it's more accurate to call it an intricately connected group of short stories, as several of the stories were published uh, prior to the publication of the novel in 2009. Um, it's not a murder mystery, although the headline mystery about the murdered family is revealed in time, along with many other mysteries. Uh, the family trees, which don't appear in the book and I had to create, uh, are as complex as the people that they describe. Yeah, it was really complex. Uh, a few notes about the author, Louise Erdrich, is a Native American author of novels, short stories, nonfiction, poetry, and children's books. Um, grew up in, uh, born in Little Falls, Minnesota, uh, to Ojibwe and French descent, and grew up in North Dakota, uh, as featured in the book. Um, she earned her BA from Dartmouth and her MA from Johns Hopkins in the late 70s, so about the same time frame as one of the characters in the book, Evelina. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can see some you can perhaps see some autobiographical uh, hints in one of her uh, main narrators. Right. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a quick overview. She's got a lot of awards. This book, notably, was uh, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in uh, 2009. Yeah. So, uh, any comments? Um, uh, just other than that, um, she also owns a bookstore uh -huh, yes. in Minneapolis, which is very cool. It's an independent bookstore. and uh, Birch Bark Books. Birch Bark Books. She wrote a, uh, a children's novel called The Birch Bark House, which is kind of described as Little House on the Prairie told from the Native American point of view. You know, they talk about daily life, what they ate, how they lived, you know, hunting their parents, their siblings, you know, their pets, all that kind of stuff, you know, just basic, um, this is how we lived kind of thing in the same time period as Little House on the Prairie took place. So that was a really interesting book. It's called The Birch Bark House, if you're interested. Fantastic, thank you. Should we go on to the questions? Let's take a look at the questions. Let's take a look at the questions. What are the book's themes? That's... Let's start off with a big one. That's a big one. <laughs> So very loosely, I would say the theme is um, life, the life of uh, the life and struggles of Native American people in uh, early twentieth century. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very, very loosely, uh, going up into uh, about the seventies uh, is the kind of the present of the book. I think also the. Um the way that um, Native Americans and um, immigrants who farmed the land initially, German, the German, German and Scandinavian immigrants, yeah. how they interacted with each other. Because, um, yeah, I, I, this is, I had come from that part of the world. You know, I grew up in Minnesota and I went to school in Fargo for four years. So I'm very familiar with the area, I'm familiar with the people. Um, I myself am Scandinavian and German descent, and uh, we are not, we were not so nice nope. to them. And that was, that was a little uncomfortable for me, but I'm glad that I read it because I needed to know it. So central to the book. Um, so the, the murder, uh, the murder of the farm family it is, happens in it the happens, very first page. Yeah, the first page of the book mentions that. We're not spoiling um, anything for you. And uh, so, so. Part of that is the reaction of the town to it, which was so lynched Native Americans. Right. Uh, so that uh, that history kind of permeates uh, the very the beginning of the book, uh, 
and it comes back to it several times throughout the rest of the novel as well. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say even that that particular controversy is central to the book, though. No. It start, it start, that's where it starts, and you spend a lot of time there, but the book kind of goes all over the place. It does. Um, and deals with a whole lot of different struggles, uh, atrocities, um, and not atrocities flicked on a people, like the Native Americans, but it's specific these, people. You know, to specific people. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not easy reading, per se, uh, but it's... I thought some of it was. I mean, some of it was very much, you know, everyday life, especially yeah. when you're talking about Evelina and, you know, the crush that she had in was the sixth grade and um, Corwin Peace mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, her whole story. Um, yeah, Evelina's story was lovely. Yes, yes, I really enjoyed her as a narrator. Yeah, um, and it wasn't all you know easy for her, but it was it was interesting, and mm -hmm. she was she was a great narrator. Mm -hmm. uh, the other narrators were uh, Judge. Judge Anton Basil Coates, yes, um, Marn Wold, mm -hmm. and uh, the last one's kind of a spoiler, so yeah, we won't. Uh, that. Yeah, let's let's not talk about that one yet. We'll discuss it next week. Um, but uh, the judge is he, uh, so he's a judge for the reservation. Uh, and talks about uh, kind of his history, uh, or the history of one of his ancestors and their relationship with the chip with the peace family. Uh, he talks about uh, administering tribal justice uh, to, in you know in his lands, mm -hmm. uh, trying to work within the legal system mm -hmm. to help to help people. We should mention that. Um Judge, how do you say his last name? Cuts or Coates? Coates, I think. He is half Native American, yes. is that correct? Yes, okay. And Just then make sure. uh, Marn Wold, who uh, marries Billy Peace, uh, and uh, how that kind of becomes a, uh, he's a... He's a charismatic man who does a lot of things. Uh, so, and just how that turns out. So, so let's see. What are the book's themes? There are a lot. There are all of the <laughs> But the second question is really interesting because we talked about that a little bit this morning. What is the symbolic meaning of the doves? So the plague of doves, uh, the book, so after the murder, uh, the book opens with a, uh, a, vin a really interesting vignette of the, of I think, 1896. Uh, they're farming, uh, you know, a farming community, and there's a, a plague of doves. Uh, uh, doves descend on the town. Everywhere. And, they're just uh, they're in everything. Eating all the crops, yep. uh, getting into the outhouses. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a lot to take in. Um, so, and how the community uh, ultimately dealt with that menace. Uh, so what is the symbolism of and then that's a really excellent question because, well, I mean, it's, it's that vignette, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the title of the book. And yet, you know. Right. Um, so I kind of thought maybe that it was the symbolism related to the Peace family uh, because we get a lot of secondhand accounts of them uh, and doves are a symbol of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, yeah, that they were kind of related, and they shared, in a lot of cases, a similar fate. Mm -hmm. I thought also it might have something to do with, um, I mean, they, they talk about um, the buffalo as well, you know, how they were plentiful, and then all of a sudden they were almost all gone. The way that they go about mass executing these doves is, is kind of a way of, of thinking about the Native American people and how they were just mass executed off the map. Um, they, they weren't wanted on the farms and, um, you know, as delicious as they were to eat, apparently, yeah. um, there were just too many of them to deal with, so they were, they were disposed of. That's probably the better analogy, but yeah. <laughs> but, you. You, you know, yeah. I think that, yeah, um, obviously the name Peace 
and the symbol symbolism of the dove being peaceful, definitely there's a connection there as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. All right, question three. The author uses individual stories to weave the overall plot. To what extent do these individual stories enrich your reading experience and or did you experience them as a distraction? Go. <laughs> Uh, so the individual stories, that's something that I really like mm -hmm. in a book um, that you see with, uh, it's common to the magical realism genre, mm -hmm. uh, the works of Isabel A. and A, yeah. uh, where you, you meet this side character and then you delve into their whole life story. Mm -hmm. um, and we got a little bit of that in this book. Uh, and that was, uh, so it kind of, uh, it's kind of related to the uh, uh, interconnectedness I mentioned of, of a bunch of unrelated short stories or mm -hmm. related short stories. Loosely related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to, to an extent, it's kind of distracting, but uh, I really liked it when you get that fuller picture of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than from just one perspective, uh, you can see how everybody relates. It reminds me of um, the Pulitzer Prize winning book, All of Kitteridge by Elizabeth Strout, which is also- Won that year. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, that's right, that same, same year. year, okay. Yeah, so um, All of Kitteridge is a book of interconnected short stories. And All of Kitteridge is the um, high school English teacher in this small town in Maine, I believe it is. And uh, she appears somewhere in each story, but sometimes it's all about her and sometimes she's just mentioned in the background. And um, I, I liked this, um, Plague of Doves, because um, I, I enjoyed, like, like you said, delving into maybe a character that wouldn't necessarily get attention in a regular novel. They would be more of like a secondary character. Mm -hmm. Whereas this book really meandered a lot. Uh, and it was, um, but, and yet, it almost kind of made a full circle. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I appreciated that. Question four. In what ways does the Plague of Doves resemble a traditional mystery? Are there ways in which it differs from a traditional mystery? So, uh, like I said, I wouldn't call it a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. um, there is one of those, uh, possibly even more. Yeah. Uh, once you get into the uh, once you get into the events of it. Uh, but you know, like who who killed the family, uh, which eventually and why. is revealed yes. as a why, not necessarily true enough. Uh, which is which can be frustrating. Um, so we we didn't really get that. Uh, so that's kind of how it differs. I would say that's one one main way. Sorry, the I hope it comes back. There we go. Yay! Yay! Um, your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Um, well, like I said, I don't, I, like you said, I don't think of it as a murder mystery at all. I think of it as a collection of interconnected short stories. And while there is a mystery in there, it's not, we're not led, we're not compelled to think about who did it as we go along. It's not, it's not a whodunit. It's, it's more of a, this is the way the world works in this, this part of the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. I don't really think it was a murder mystery at all. No. I didn't feel that way. No. And then the last question, how does your understanding of Musham change by the end of the book? Musham was a great character. He was the uh, grandfather of Evelina, and he is um, a Native American who was very, very lucky. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a lot of the early part of the book is him telling stories to his grandchildren. Um, and you're not sure how much of those stories is truth. And what's embellished. Uh, and it's really fascinating. And then by the end of it, uh, we get some additional perspectives on him, mm -hmm. some things he might have done. Right. Um, uh, that doesn't really change that how he was you know treated unfairly right. or how his life was 
And I think it all depends yeah. on who is framing his character. You know, for instance, my grandfather, I thought was an amazing person, and he was, but other people may have had a different opinion of him. You know, right. I, I think about that, and just like the way um, Louise Erdrich frames the way somebody is viewing the particular character. You know, I mean, we get different different lenses and different perspectives when um, we have different narrators, which is uh, rather interesting. Um, if you haven't read the book, uh, uh, I urge you to, first of all. Yes. Um, but uh, there's particular one particular part uh, where, uh, with uh, Mush Mushim at a funeral, yeah, uh, that I think is uh, just really, uh, really entertaining. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, he's quite a character, and um, the understanding is just kind of added on to, rather mm -hmm. than you know, you don't, it, nothing's taken away. No, I don't think so. I thought he was one of the more interesting characters in the book. Definitely. Yes. So, um, those are our questions. Yep. Uh, any final comments? Final comments. Um, well, we haven't talked about Louise Erdrich's um, lyrical prose. I mean, it's just beautifully written. The, the language is just so lovely. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my thought. Yeah. Uh, definitely worth a read for the language as well. Yeah. yeah. So oh. join us uh, next week, Tuesday, January 26th, 2 p.m. Uh, email me, uh, pick uh, words on the screen here, that's my email address, and then you'll get an invitation to the uh, chat. The Zoom chat Zoom that we're going to do. Yeah, we're so. all going to get together and talk about what we loved and what we hated, and there's always someone who loved it and always someone who didn't, so it always makes for a good discussion. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.